So in today's lecture, we'll be covering the acupuncture needling techniques. So this lecture is actually broken down into two parts. The first part will be the basic information on how to perform the needling technique. And then the second part will go into much more detail showing specific and more advanced needling techniques. And the reason why we split it like that is I want you to be able to start practicing as soon as possible as it requires many hours of practice to get proficient in the technique. And what you need to develop is the proper finger skill, strength, flexibility and sensitivity. And this all requires many hours of practice. So what we'll be covering in this lecture is firstly the structure, the inspection and storage of needles. Then we'll be looking at the different insertion techniques, both the double-handed and single-handed insertions. Then we'll move on to the angles of insertion, the direction of insertion, and how deep you can insert the needles. So firstly, the structure of the needle. So as we mentioned in the introduction lectures, the needles can be made from various materials, and historically they were made from substances such as bone or bamboo. But now in recent times, we mostly use different types of metals, with stainless steel being the most common type of metal used in most needles. But you can still get needles made from other metals, such as steel, copper, iron, or gold. So now if you look at this image here on the right, this image here shows you the structure of a needle. So there are five main components of a needle. Firstly, the sharp end of the needle over here. This is known as the tip. And then it's the portion that's inserted to the body, which is from here to here. That's known as the body. And then the root is the junction between the body and the handle. And the difference between the body and the handle is that the handle is wrapped with a piece of wire to make it easier to grasp and manipulate this part of the needle. And then the top portion of a year, which is also made from the wire, but it's made slightly larger than the handle, is known as the tail. And the function of this part is makes it easier to manipulate the needle. So this needle we've been looking at here is known as the coiled handle needle and is the most common type of needle you'll see. You might also see a needle called the coiled dragon on the handle needle. This is very similar to the coiled handle needle, but the wire wrapped around the handle is done in more ornamental designs to make the needle look much prettier. Then we have the flat bodied handle, which is the same as the coiled handle, except it doesn't have the tail at the top over here. And then we have the last type, which is called tube tube-like handle, which has a tube instead of a piece of wire for the handle. And so next, let's move on to the specifications. If you see this image on the right here of a box of needles, there are a few important details that are put onto the one side of the box. And you can see these over here. So firstly, this here is the date of manufacture of the needles. Then this below it, the later date, is the date of expiry of the needles. So when they are, are no longer considered sterile. So this number here is the batch number. And then the final number over here is the specifications of the needles in this box. So as you can see, it's got a, a circle with a line through it, which tells you that it's the size of the needle. And then it's got 0, 0.25 times 25, which explains to you both the width of the needle and the length of the needle. So let's look at the first part, the 0, 0.25, also known as the width or the diameter of the needle. So the width of the needle or the diameter of the needle is the length from year to year of the needle. And this varies depending on your goals for the treatments. So the most common way these needles are classified is in this manner with a 0, 0,25, which means that it's 0, 0,25 millimeters wide. And if you look at this table on the left here, you'll notice that there are various widths that the needles can be. And above this is another method used to classify the widths of needles known as gauges. And the gauges are numbers which represent the different widths. So a gauge 26 needle would be 0.45 millimeters wide, whereas a gauge 30 needle would be 0.32 millimeters wide. And this method of classification is not as commonly used. So I would like you to rather focus on learning the bottom method and just take note that this is another method you might see on the box. And then of all these different widths, the most common widths we use in Western practices is from 0.35 so from here to 0.2, which is not on this, would be over here. And then next, let's talk about the lengths. So the length is the second number after the x. So it's 0.25 times 25. And the 25 represents how long the needle is. 
So a 25 would mean the needle is 25 millimeters long. And that's a measurement from here, the tip to the root of the needle would be 25 millimeters. And then the lengths of needles come in various different sizes from seven millimeters all the way up to 115 millimeters. And there's even longer sizes than this. And then another important thing to note here is this top measurement here on the table. This is the inches, which is the same as what we call tsun, which is the measurement they use in China. And one tsun is equal to one inch or to 25 millimeters. So later on, when we go into the individual points, you'll see when I tell you the length of insertion is one tsun, that would mean you're inserting the needle 25 millimeters deep. So the tsun measurements are used more commonly in China, whereas the millimeter measurements are used more commonly in the Western world. So next, let's look at the inspection and storage of needles. So when expecting a needle, what you first got to do is make sure that the needle is straight, the tip is sharp, the needle is clean and has no rust on it, and that the handle is evenly and tightly wrapped. Usually we do not expect every single needle, but you may need to do this if you have doubts on the quality or the standard of the needle that you've purchased. Then secondly, the storage. So there are two different methods of storage. One is for disposable needles and one is for reusable needles. So for disposable needles, they come in boxes like this and then in smaller packets like this image on the right. And what we do is we do not open either the box or the packet before we need to use them. So right before we will use it, we'll start opening the box and then these individual packets and we will only open each individual needle as we need it. So as we're going through with our treatment, we'll open one needle at a time and use them immediately. And with this method, you need to be careful and check that none of the packets have been previously opened. Now let's look at the reusable needles. When using reusable needles, we normally have a needle box or tube in which we store the needles. Then needles after use are sterilized in an autoclave. But this method is not recommended and isn't used much nowadays due to the presence of so many different blood-borne diseases. So now we're going to move on to the different insertion techniques, starting with the most commonly used, the needle in tube insertion, which is a double-handed insertion. So the first step is always to palpate and locate the correct acupuncture point or the location, the correct location of where you want to needle. Once you have found the point, you're going to disinfect the region. And our method for disinfection, we'll go into more detail in the practical aspect, but you're going to dip the sterilized earbud two-thirds of the way into the alcohol and then you're going to disinfect in a clockwise circle from the center of the acupuncture point to the outer area. And then you're going to take the packet and open up a single needle and tube and make sure that the needle and tube are of the correct size. We then place them onto the acupuncture point and while holding the tube with our palpating hand we swiftly tap the tail of the needle with our inserting hand. Then we remove the tube and we grasp the handle of the needle and insert to our desired length, making sure to obtain dirty sensation. The next method we'll be looking at is known as the fingernail pressing method. And this method is also a double handed insertion. So some aspects of this insertion are the same as the previous method. Firstly, we're going to palpate the point, then we're gonna disinfect the region, and then we're going to remove the needle and tube from the packet and place it on the acupuncture point. But where this method varies is that the palpating hand then presses on the acupuncture point with either the thumb or the index finger, and then the tube of the acupuncture needle is placed against the nail of the palpating hand. We then tap to swiftly insert the needle, we remove the tube, and then with the needle still pressing against the nail of the palpating hand, we insert the needle to the desired depth and obtain dirty sensation. And the reason why we use this method is that firstly, it helps us to insert the shorter needles. The second reason why is to help protect some region. So what I mean here is when you're inserting a point that is very close to an artery, a tendon, or a vein, we can then use the thumb or index finger of our palpating hand to locate this artery or blood vessel and protect it by keeping the thumb there, ensuring that the needle will not damage the blood vessel. 
So the next insertion technique that we'll look at is also a double-handed insertion, except this one is called the hand-holding insertion. And what it involves is similar to the other two. Firstly, we're going to palpate and locate the correct point. Then we're going to disinfect the region. And then the needle is placed on the acupuncture point and is grasped with the palpating hand. And then we gently tap the tail of the needle with the inserting hand. Once the needle has been inserted, we then remove the tube and we grasp a dry sterile cotton ball with our palpating hand and we use it to grasp the body of the needle. We can then insert the needle using the palpating hand to support the body of the needle so it doesn't bend and using the inserting hand to provide the downward pressure. The other method, which is the picture on the right, which we can use our inserting hand to grasp the cotton ball and then grasp the body of the needle. We can then perform a single-handed insertion and holding the needle much lower so that it does not bend. This insertion method is used on locations where you would want to use longer needles. These are needles that are longer than two tin, and the areas where we use these needles are normally either the glutes or the legs. Then the next insertion technique is known as the skin spreading insertion. This is also one of the double-handed insertions and it follows a similar procedure to the other techniques. Firstly, we're going to palpate the region, then we're going to disinfect the region, and then finally we're going to place the tube on the point and grasp the tube with the palpating hand and swiftly tap the tail of the needle with the inserting hand. Then we can remove the tube and place the two fingers of our palpating hand, just like this in the image, on either side of the needle and stretch the skin by pushing the fingers away from one another. And once the skin is stretched, we can then insert the needle to the desired depth, once again trying to obtain dirty sensation. This method is most commonly used on areas where the skin is slightly softer or more flexible. This is areas such as the abdomen or gluteal regions. And then the two images on the right just show slight differences in the technique. The one here on the left uses the index finger and the middle finger to create the tension to stretch the skin whereas the image on the right uses the thumb and index finger to create that tension. But the rest of the technique is exactly the same. The next technique we're going to look at is known as the pinching insertion technique. This is also a double-handed insertion and is very similar to all the previous techniques. Firstly, we're going to palpate and locate the correct point or acupuncture point. Then we're going to disinfect the region. Then we will place the needle in the tube or we'll remove the needle from the packaging and place it on the acupuncture point. One thing that's different here is that we actually have to hold the tube with our inserting hand and that would be done by holding it with your middle finger and your thumb, keeping the index finger free to tap the needle. We're then going to take our palpating hand and gently pinch the skin and pull it slightly away from the surface of the body. We can then tap the needle with our inserting hand and remove the tube and insert to the desired depth obtaining the chi sensation. And the reason why we would use this technique is on any area where there isn't much soft tissue to work with. So this will help us to avoid puncturing either an important organ or hitting the bone. So the next technique is the final insertion technique that we'll talk about. And this one is known as a single-handed insertion. So from all the other techniques we've done previously, they can all be done either with a tube or without a tube. But this technique is slightly different. This one can only be done without a tube. And what it requires, it requires a lot of practice to develop your skill and proficiency. This will then enhance the effects and mitigate the discomfort the patient feels when the insertion is done. So what do we have to do for this insertion? So firstly, like the other ones, we've got to palpate and locate the correct acupuncture points. We then got to disinfect the region. But yeah, we also have to disinfect the inserting hand as it will be grasping the body of the needle. We then take our index and thumb of the inserting hand and we grasp the handle of the needle or the body of the needle, depending on the length of the needle we are using. We then use the middle finger to support the body of the needle near its tip. We can then bring the needle close to the acupuncture point and swiftly press downwards to insert the needle into the skin. Once the needle has gone through the skin surface, we can then insert the needle deeper to our desired depth to achieve the chi sensation. This method is less commonly used in the West as it is much more difficult to master. So most practitioners prefer to use the needle and tube method. 
but this method does have a few advantages as it doesn't have the problems of the tubes that when you're needling a point that is at a funny angle, the needles can sometimes fall out of the tube, whereas this method won't have that same problem. Next, let's move on to the angles of insertion. So if you look at the image on the right here, when we refer to the angle of insertion, what we are referring to is we are referring to the angle of the needle, so here's the needle, to the angle of the skin, and the skin is represented here. So that's the angle from the needle to the skin, this angle. And what I want you to also remember here is that we always refer to the angle of the needle to the skin, not to the ground. So sometimes on certain parts of the body, depending where you're needling, the skin might look something like this. So a perpendicular insertion of here would look like this, whereas a perpendicular insertion of this part of the body would be this direction. So just remember that when you're looking at the angle of insertion for the different points. So let's first look at perpendicular insertions. And what this means is it's a 90 degree angle from the surface of the skin, like this. So that's this needle over here. And this is normally the most commonly used method. And as I mentioned earlier, we often use this method on areas where there's a lot of soft tissue between the skin and the bone or the skin and the blood vessels as this method allows us to get the needle much deeper. And in these cases, there's much less risk of us puncturing anything if there's a lot of soft tissue to work with. Then the second method is known as the oblique insertion. And this is at a 45 degree angle. So that's this angle from here to here. It should be at about a 45 degree angle, which is about half of what the distance is from year to year. And where we use this method, is we use this method wherever there are organs that are close to the surface of the body or where there is not as much underlying tissue. But the underlying tissue is not so thin that we need to use the horizontal insertion. And then the final method of insertion is known as a horizontal insertion or you might see it called a transverse insertion or a subcutaneous insertion. And what this refers to is an insertion which is at 15 degrees or less. So from year to year is 15 degrees or less. And most commonly, your needle would be almost parallel to the skin, more like this. And this method is used where there's very little underlying tissue. And as I mentioned earlier, this is areas like the skull. So the fourth aspect of needling is known as the direction of insertion. And this is closely linked with the angles of insertion as they're both affected by the same factors such as the anatomical structure below the point, the desired therapeutic effects, the nature of the illness and the condition of the patient. So firstly, let's look at the therapeutic effects. So if a practitioner desired to reinforce or reduce a point, they could direct the needle either to follow or go against the meridian's natural flow. So the natural flow will be the direction that the meridian flows. So what would happen if we wanted to reinforce the point is we would angle the tip of the needle to follow the flow of the meridian. Whereas if we wanted to reduce the point, we would angle the tip to flow against the flow of the meridian. So what this means is, for instance, if the meridian was running from the tips of the finger up to the shoulder, if we were following it, we would point the tip of the needle towards the shoulder. Whereas if we wanted to go against the flow, we would point it towards the tip of the fingers. The second method we can use, which is also related to therapeutic effects, is according to the therapeutic area. What this refers to is the disordered area. So then what we would do is we would insert the needle towards the affected area. For instance, large intestine 20, Yingxiang, is located just lateral to the nose. And if we wanted to treat nasal problems, what we would do with large intestine 20 is that we would needle it horizontally towards the center of the nose. And this would help to assist the effect in treating nasal problems. And then secondly, according to anatomy or location, so what this means is that we can change our direction of insertion to help ensure safety. For instance, point on the bladder meridian, the first line of the bladder meridian on the back, which is about 1.5 soon lateral to the spine. These points are always needled medially towards the spine because if they were needled perpendicular, or they were needled obliquely towards the lateral aspect, both these methods carry a risk of puncturing the underlying organ, which is the lungs, and this can cause serious complications. 
So that's why we much rather prefer to needle medially towards the spine to ensure that it is safe. And then our fifth and final aspect of needling that we're gonna look at is the depth of insertion. So once again, this is closely linked to the angle and depth of insertion that we just talked about, as it is also affected by the anatomy, the therapeutic effects, the nature of the illness and the condition of the patient. And the first thing to note here is that the depth of insertion is specific to each point, as each point has a different anatomical position and thus there's a different amount of flesh or bone or different anatomical organs that are nearby. The second factor we look at is the age of the patient. And generally what we do is we prefer shallower insertions for patients that are elderly and for children. And then thirdly, the location. So in general, points on the head and face and chest use more superficial or shallower insertions, whereas points on the abdomen, limbs and buttocks generally have much deeper insertions, as these areas have much more flesh than those on the head, face and chest. Our fourth factor is the constitution of the patient. So we use in general shallower insertions on the weak or thin patients and deeper insertions on the bulkier and stronger patients. And the fifth and final aspect that affects our insertion is the pathological condition. So what this refers to is that in young syndromes and acute diseases, we prefer a shallower insertion, whereas in yin syndromes and chronic diseases, we prefer a deeper insertion. And this is linked to our yin-yang theory, as what we know from yin and yang is that the yang is more exterior, whereas the yin is more interior. And this is why we change the depth of insertion, so that the depth is in relation to the depth of yin or yang, and thus will have a better effect. And that's the end of the lecture. Thank you for watching.